Hello everybody and welcome to Dry Dock episode 90. Two and a half months to go before we hit the big 100 and I have to do something. I uh, don't know what it's going to be, but something will be done. Um, this week's questions are taken from the Preserving History, One Step at a Time Wednesday video, and Guide 161 for PT Squadron 3. So let us get on with the questions. Fabian Zimmerman asks, Admiral Iachino and Admiral Cunningham switch navies. Will Iachino, with more and better battleships to start with, be more offensive, and would, what would Cunningham do to make the Regia Marina a formidable threat to the Royal Navy, and who is more likely to win? Well, this is a question that really showcases the leadership of men and how that affects their fleets, and therefore who is more likely to actually win engagements, because in this theoretical switchover, Iochino does start the war with Italy, bizarre, it's a bit bizarre to say that, but anyway, he starts his war with Italy with, as you say, a superior fleet, since the Italian fleet at that point is made up purely of, at least in capital ship form, the refitted World War One era dreadnoughts. However, that margin of superiority does not last a very long, because Littorio and Vittorio Veneto are both in service in the middle of 1940. Now, much as it might sound like heresy, a refitted World War I era Queen Elizabeth class is not a match for a Littorio class, at least on paper. The Littorio class is faster, it's more heavily armed, Armour is... yeah, yeah maybe. Um, that's a whole other uh, box of frogs to open up. But, broadly speaking, yes, a Littorio should walk all over a refit Queen Elizabeth class. Now, factor in the appalling level of quality control on Italian shell-making, Admiral Iacchino's lack of leadership, and the fact that war spite is... War spite, and thus comes with its own inherent plot shields. Um, that kind of alters the fact, the bat factors in that equation a little bit. But still, on paper, the Italian fleet by the end of 1940 has a significant advantage over the Royal Navy in the Mediterranean in every possible um, paradigm except for aircraft carriers. It's more a mark against the failure. Of leadership in the upper echelons of the Italian Navy that they didn't accomplish more than what they did. So if our situations are reversed, then in theory Iachino will probably start out conducting a number of offensives, which is basically what he did historically. However, following his pattern of initially completely underestimating and then completely overestimating the enemy, and given Cunningham's particular skills, if Cunningham is handed a decidedly inferior fleet with no aircraft carrier support and is then told that, yeah, that there's a very aggressive superior fleet coming for you, he's going to deny them the battle because there is no point in selling himself and his fleet, which bear in mind is the only fleet that he has, in a battle that may or may not weaken the enemy force when the enemy has other fleets which they can draw ships into even if you somehow pull off some kind of spectacular score draw or, or pyrrhic victory once he gets the two Latorios in place then he's obviously going to be able to take a lot more offensive action and resist enemy sweeps now fair enough the royal navy under iachino does ha still have a radar and carrier advantage however um Apart from being highly aggressive in the opening parts of the war, Iachino seems to be one of these people who never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. So it's highly likely that what will happen is Iachino will be very uh, will continue to be uh, very aggressive even after Latoria and Vittorio Veneto come into service. Cunningham will probably conduct some practice shoots, probably discover the quality control issues with the shells almost certainly have somebody hanged and then 
probably then uh, have the shell quality come back to something more like approaching normal. And then he's going to lead his fleet out and he will do exactly what he did to the Italians at Cape Mataban, except in reverse and probably not a night battle. But more broadly, he will punish Iachino's forces um, for overconfidence. And, well, if he's got two Latorios on his side and their gun, uh, their shell issues have been fixed, that's going to be a lot of uh, rather painful punishment going on there. At which point, given the historical performance of Iachino, he will then promptly start to overestimate the enemy in every way, shape or form and probably hang back and try and pick things off with carrier strikes and such like, which will probably allow Cunningham to dominate the central Mediterranean, which improves the supply situation for the Africa Corps quite significantly. Probably means Malta will fall in the end. Um, and also, obviously, if if Iachino and Cunningham are switching at the beginning of the war, Cunningham's going to be screaming at the Italians to get the Gufo radar up and working. So yeah, um, long story short, at the very least I'd expect Cunningham by 1941 to be lord of the central Mediterranean, and if he then carries that forward, I mean admittedly the Italians do have their own fuel and other resource shortages, uh, to contend with, but I would probably expect him to also in take Malta. Now, how much that's going to affect the overall outcome of the war is another matter entirely, because um, the forces that were being built up to kick Rommel out of North Africa, along with obviously his Italian allies, those forces are going to be built up anyway. Rommel and, and the Italians will be better supplied, but Cunningham can't physically affect the sheer numbers of men and resources that the Allies can put into that operation. So, well, yeah, there you go. Sea battle, that's why I do sea battles, not land. Mm. Semel Khan Khan asks, why did the Monitor evolve from a very short-range riverine and coastal vessels of like USS Monitor to the kind of low-draft coastal bombardment vessels of the Royal Navy type? And why were they still called Monitors? Well, in part, Due to the uh, rather interesting and varied evolution of the Monitor in the American Civil War, the term Monitor became less associated with a specific ship and more associated with a general concept of small ship with hilariously oversized guns and a shallow draft, useful for shore bombardment for the most part. Um, this was obviously helped by the fact that the various US monitors included some that were notionally ocean going towards the latter part of the American Civil War. The idea of a small yet heavily armed craft that could obviously therefore theoretically punch significantly above its weight was very attractive to a large number of navies. Obviously for smaller navies it was attractive on the basis that it would allow them to maybe not challenge, but at least fend off the advances of larger navies without having to match their build program. For a number of European powers with extensive riverine systems, such as the Austro-Hungarian Empire, there was, well, Austrian Empire maybe at that point in time, um, there was the additional attraction of the fact that you could then get heavy naval artillery onto the river systems, which historically had been something of an issue. And that was especially the case given that obviously in a confined river system you're much more easily able to be engaged by land-based artillery, so the armoured part was definitely a help there. So monitors began to get taken up across for these various countries, and obviously the nomenclature stuck. However, when it came to certain navies, especially the Royal Navy, they didn't need a defensive ship so much for British waters. There were fairly regular invasion scares, albeit a lot of it was mass media type stuff, um, to the point that actually invasion scare genre, the invasion scare genre became its whole little sub-branch of literature in late 19th century England, which is most amusing. Um, exactly who was invading? It was usually France, and by the turn of the century it sort of gradually shifted over to Germany, but that's neither here nor there. So whilst the Royal Navy did build a few vaguely inspired by American uh, Navy development monitors, they needed a vessel that 
could actually transition the seas a lot more reliably. That was because of their global reach, the fact that the few areas they did identify as needing uh, this kind of defence were overseas, and the attraction of the monitor for the Royal Navy was the fact that because it was smaller, it was therefore cheaper, which meant they could build a lot more of them, which meant they could concentrate uh, their major ships in fewer fleets, and obviously then in theory would also te technically have more money to build even bigger um, central broad broadside and a centre battery and turret ironclads, which was always good for, for their purposes. However, the in order to do so, they had to improve the seagoing capabilities, as I said, so they had to invent what was called the breastwork monitor initially, which was effectively a just a slightly larger version of the US monitors in general design principles, but had a collapsible breastwork that allowed the sides to be made artificially higher for seaborne travel, whilst not actually increasing the overall size of the ship all that much for engagement and general operations. The Australian Cerberus, which is the picture that's been gracing your screens for the last few minutes, is a prime example of this. It's bigger than the American monitors because of that need to be transoceanic in the first place, which means bigger engines, it's better, slightly better sea keeping, etc. But you can still see it's fairly shallow draft. Um, now, this whole concept kind of died off a bit in the latter part of the 19th century because the whole very small relative to full-on battleships um, punching above its weight kind of vessel that slot was taken up by the torpedo boat and then the torpedo boat destroyer and then eventually the destroyer and destroyers were even smaller cheaper and had even more capability in theory at least to demolish battleships than even monitors did and so at least for the ocean going dash coastal defense parts the monitor went out of fashion in favor of things like the coastal defense battleship and uh, destroyer and submarine flotillas however when it came time to build shore bombardment vessels, effectively, someone took a look at it and went, hmm, it's a shallow draft, low speed vessel that can't fight in a full on battle line but has ridiculously oversized guns. Didn't we have some of those a few decades ago? Oh, yeah, what were they called? Oh, monitors. Hmm, I guess we're calling them monitors then. And then it kind of ran on, ran on with it from there. Joker Takaninja JK asks, do you have any plans on partially covering the Ottoman Navy and especially the ships that they planned and never made? Sure, in the fullness of time. Um, ships of the Ottoman Navy, well, the five minute guides, are, as I've said before, are done in the chronological list in which they were requested, um, except for obviously the first of the month Patreon specials. So it's, it's as how long is a piece of string as far as... Um, when I get to those particular ships uh, goes. Now, as far as things like possibly Wednesday specials on the Ottoman Navy, yes, those will be coming. Um, there are a couple of phases in the Ottoman Navy that fall into the period that we mainly look at that I definitely do want to cover at some point. It's just a matter of finding a slot for when I'm going to cover them. So, yeah, it, it could be this year could be next year who knows um see how things go the spencer brown asks this may have been asked before but what in your opinion was the best battle cruiser of the first world war era on paper and in practice well i think there's two distinct lines to draw here um which is ships that were actually in service and ships that were designed dash started because those are two very wildly different differing uh, sets of capabilities. I mean, if you're looking on in terms of ships that were designed dash laid down but never completed, it's basically a two horse race between the Mackinsons and the final version of the Admiral class. In that particular respect, the redone versions of the Admiral class, the ones that would have succeeded Hood probably just about edge out the Mackinsons. Um, Mar I mean, they're both armed with eight 15-inch guns, but the Admirals have the 15-inch 42, and they have they, they, the, the, they were, to a degree, even greater than Hood, 
very much the fusion of the battle cruiser and battleship sort of fast battle what would eventually be called the fast battleship concept um, at least for world war one era technology in terms of the ships that are actually built well you're looking at on paper a three horse race between the der flingers uh tiger and the congos now from that i would probably eliminate the congos because their armor is marginally less than tigers which puts them at the bottom of the pile armor protection wise and they don't have a massive speed advantage over the other two to make up for that now firepower wise yes they do have the largest guns at 14 inches but the 13 and a half inch guns of tiger aren't particularly far behind and with that slightly thinner armor the 12 inch guns of Der flinger probably still have a relatively decent chance against them so i mean you're talking about the top three but of those top three i think congo probably in its initial world war one configuration sits slightly lower there now when you compare Der flinger and tiger you can make a certain case for both. Tiger does have thinner armor, but and more firepower, and Defling is the other way around. Um, more Lutz or Hindenburg, but the class, basically. Now, if you were going to stack them in a 1v1, then I would, assuming that the crews had a chance to actually become vaguely competent, put my money on Tiger because Tiger's armor gives it a reasonable amount of protection against Deerflinger's guns, um, whereas Deerflinger's armor, well, as proven by Jutland, doesn't quite protect it even against the defective 13.5-inch shells that the British can throw at it, and certainly in the later part of the war, once um, those shell issues start to become corrected, then Tiger would edge it. However, that is a very specific matchup and that's not reflective of the general case. So in practice, I would actually give the best battle cruiser in service during the war to the Deerflinger. Um not well, the Deerflinger class. I mean Deerflinger itself obviously seems to have a minor set of character shields in and of itself. Not quite as there's the same level as war spites but close um but when you compare the overall design deathling has got speed it's got a decent amount of firepower with its 12 inch guns certainly enough to hurt most opponents it's going to come across um and it's also fairly well protected to the point that it can probably withstand a lot more punishment so as we said, if we're talking the one-on-ones, then that's one thing. But if, say, Tiger comes up against a Bayern, that's not a match Tiger's going to be winning any time of day. And it's probably also not going to be a match Tiger's going to be surviving any time of day unless it turns tail and runs very quickly. Whereas if Der Flinger runs into a Queen Elizabeth or a Revenge, yes, it's not going to win that fight either, but I would put a lot more money on... A Der Flinger that randomly blundered into gun range of a Queen Elizabeth escaping and surviving than I would on a Tiger that blundered into a Bayern or Barden. At which point, given that Der Flinger at that point will have done its job of protecting its crew much better, I would have to give the prize for the best battle cruiser in practice that was constructed in the First World War to the Der Flinger. Kendra Malm asks... Given that most sea battles during World War II either took place in range of shore and or carrier-based air, uh, aircraft, or at night, was there ever an instance where the scout dash spot of planes carried by cruisers and battleships proved useful in a major battle? I can think of one negative example, the Tone at Midway, but without going through all your old videos, I could only imagine one positive one with the hunt for the Bismarck. Well, battleship dash cruiser mounted scout planes would prove useful in a number of engagements. Um... Ironically enough, Bismarck wasn't one of them. The aircraft that spotted Bismarck were land-based um, land based flying boats. The aircraft that were aboard Prince of Wales, Suffolk and Norfolk were not actually instrumental in finding them. However, this picture, which you can see in on your screen now, 
this is an example of a fairly major engagement where a capital ship mounted float plane was very useful, and that is the Second Battle of Narvik, which also known as Warspite's killing spree against the German destroyer flotillas. And as you might imagine, trying to sail a battleship up a fjord where there's German destroyer around every corner might seem on paper very suicidal, but one of the ways that Warspite got around this was by launching its own little scout aircraft which could then obviously look over the hills and go oh yes i see that there is a german destroyer waiting around this corner and then obviously signal back to the war spite that it should aim its guns and prepare to blow it clean out of the water the minute it got round into visual range which of course war spite did and there was also uh, scout planes used during the battle of the river plate and also in a number of other engagements by battleships but those were pro or and cruisers those were probably the two actual sort of full-on fights where uh, aircraft spotting came came very much in handy aircraft spotting was very useful in a number of as i said in a number of other battleship um engagements but they weren't the kind of major peer fights they were either scouting force um individual small ships or for um, gunfire support on land in shore bombardment operations and such so they still definitely did have a very useful role uh, for much of the second world war albeit there wasn't necessarily always what was envisaged for them but as you say a lot of the actual main battleship actions certainly took place in environments where either it was very bad weather or at night or else towards the end of the war when the ships were using their radar instead of scout aircraft. But they still had a purpose, and um, you can see that actually even when they recommissioned the Iowas in the 1980s, they installed a set of drones which took the place of the old scout aircraft, again, roughly for the same purpose. BK Zhang asks, Every single big gun capital ship, so battleships, battlecruisers, and large cruisers, to enter service after 1935 is teleported back to Jutland at the start of the engagement and attacks both the British and German forces. Does the uptime Ultimate Battle Squadron have it in them to sink the entire Grand Fleet and High Seas Fleet capital ship forces present, or will they just turn the World War I capital ships into burning but float out, floating wreckage that can return to port for repairs. Well, this is quite the considerable squadron because you're talking about five King George V's, Vanguard, uh, all from the Royal Navy, so that's six battleships from there. The Japanese are going to be weighing in with the Yamato and Musashi, that's going to be fun. Um, the Americans are going to have North Carolina. Washington, the four South Dakotas, the four Iowas, plus Alaska and Guam, so that's another what, 10, cap 10 battleships and two large cruisers. And the Italians are going to be pitching in with Littorio, Vittorio Veneto and Roma. The French are going to be pitching in with at least Richelieu and Jean Bar. And since you said entered service as opposed to was laid down, that also will include Dunkirk, Strasbourg, Scharnhorst, Neisenhow, Bismarck, and Tirpitz. So um, that that's quite quite the battle line you've you've got there. That's thirty one ships all told. Which yeah, um, at that point they are just about over the two to one outnumbering um margin so they're probably outnumbered like 1.7 1.8 to 1 but in that's it, it, with those odds it's an absolute slaughter um the majority of those ships have radar so they're going to be able to see through the gloom and the haze and later on the darkness if it comes to that they are all of them faster than pretty much anything except the absolute fastest battle cruisers in the world war one fleets their fire control systems are obviously superior they can engage at longer ranges and for the most part their armor is also superior in fact i, I don't think there's anything that the short of ramming that is present in 
the downtime fleets that can actually hurt Yamato and Musashi, because the only guns that even have a theoretical capability to do anything at, except at point-blank range would be the 15-inch guns on the Queen Elizabeths and Revenges in the Grand Fleet, but at this point they still have the detonate on contact um, shells, which yeah, that's not gonna not gonna help them much at all. So yeah, between the speed advantage, the spotting advantage, the range advantage, the protection advantage, and the firepower advantage, thirty plus World War Two era ships, yeah, that that will decimate the uh, the British and German forces at Jutland quite handily. Jeff F. asks, the winner of a hypothetical battle between Yamato and insert ship here is often discussed, but how would you design a battleship that could definitively defeat the Yamato, and would it simply be a Yamato with better fire control? Well, of course there is the eternal glory that is HMS Drac, as seen here, but if we're going to be dusting off and slightly modifying pre-existing ships, then there's a few options. Uh, you could take a Montana, um, albeit that in a sort of flat, calm, nice, fine, sunny day, I would say the Montana and, and the Yamato would be more of kind of equals, because as I've covered with the uh, Yamato versus Iowa, Montana's advantages lie where, uh, in sort of the more advanced technology like radar and such. In terms of armor protection and firepower, it's more of a wash. So we're talking about decisive defeats. So decisive, um, you go with Long Tanner, the the Montana version that was supposed to be near as enough as makes no difference as fast as an Iowa. That would certainly do it. Um, alternatively, you could go with one of the uh, eighteen inch armed design studies that was come up with in the 1920s for the Royal Navy, maybe something like an N3. Um, a modernized N3 could certainly stand and trade body blows with a Yamato, um, given that it's armor protection and such. Note my very heavy emphasis on the word modernized. But if I was given a free hand and told this ship had to explicitly be designed to defeat Yamato, then I would probably go with something along a kind of a Nelson style layout, i.e. all forward guns. Obviously very heavy uh very heavy armor protection. You don't need to go full on um Iowa style fast battleship. A speed of 28, 29 knots will do quite nicely because well you're supposed to be getting in a fight with this thing, you don't have to run away from it and then I would probably actually in some manner similar to kind of similar to the design of HMS Drac but I would go with a kind of a French approach of quad forward turrets I mean it's going to be big so the idea of maybe something like a quad 16 inch 50 caliber turret and then you mount three of those forward Nelson style slap a ton of armor on it rate it for 28, 29 knots, you're going to end up with something that's approaching about the size of Yamato, but it's going to have a decisive advantage in that it can bring an awful lot of firepower to bear whilst still not having to expose its entire broadside, which um, bow tanking is not a thing you want to try and do, but if you can angle yourself in such a way that you can bring your entire main armament to bear whilst the enemy has to turn further to bring their entire main armament to bear, that gives you a significantly better chance of um, scoring hits on them because their target profile is simply that much larger. And also you are then clo have more closing than horizontal um, motion, which makes the fire control solution against you harder still. <clears throat> now, the only thing I might do to change that around slightly would be rather than taking the 16 inch 50, if it w w the design worked, would be taking the theoretical auto-loading 16-inch gun that was notionally applied for some of the later ver variants of the Lion-class battleship. Because, yeah, if you've got three quad 16-inch turrets, well, three quad 16-inch 50s will do an awful lot of damage, but three quad 
auto loading 16 inch guns um once you've established the range using some decent radar and fire control there's not going to be much left at the other end helen spark asks were borrowed ships ever returned after the conflict assuming they survived or paid for or were the people who owned them just out of luck a lot of it depended on what kind of terms the borrowed ship had been borrowed on so for example the ships that would eventually become HMS Erin and HMS Agincourt were, of course, destined for the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the Ottoman Empire obviously spent a good chunk of World War One at war with the British, so the odds of the Ottoman Empire then getting their ships back at the end of it were... Um, <laughs> you must be joking, mate. Um, whereas the Almirante La Torre, as seen here, was returned to the Chileans um, after having spent a few years as HMS Canada. And likewise, there were a number of destroyers that were designed for Brazil that went to, that eventually did wind up back in Brazilian service, um, slightly used. But it, a lot of it would depend on, as I say, but both was the country in question hostile or was the, uh, the, the seizing dash borrowing on bad terms? If they weren't, then there was a good chance you would get it back. Um, there was also the case of would the country in question be able to afford to have them back and would they want to have them back depending on what happened technology wise now the thing with actually both world wars is that you could have a ship that was in theory top of the line at the time of its construction but by the time it got round to the end of the war, technology might well have advanced. The financial situation of the country who was originally purchasing them might have changed quite radically. And as a result, they may not want to pay for a somewhat used vessel that obviously had, will presumably have a fair number of miles on the clock by this point, and also is no longer the kind of top of the line ship that they were originally going to get. A good example of that would be HMS Chester and HMS Birkenhead, which were modified sort of pretty solid good design light cruisers at the start of world war one being built for greece they were then um well commandeered by the royal navy uh, under relatively um, decent terms and then at the end of the war they were offered for sale back to greece unfortunately when it came to uh, actually selling them back the greeks didn't particularly want them their finances weren't in as good a situation as they had been in the early 1910s and although the town class had been a top of the line light cruiser in 1913 1914 what constituted top of the line light cruisers in 1918 1919 was a very very different thing and so they ended up going to a scrapyard but yeah in, in general Assuming you hadn't actively fought against the country that had commandeered your ship, you stood a relatively good chance of being offered the ship back. Whether or not you could afford it or indeed wanted it back was another question entirely, because that, this is the other thing. The ships may be requisitioned, but it was more of compulsory purchase. It wasn't, nice ship, we'll have it. It was There was actually a, we like your ship, here's a bunch of money um, so that we can have it, but you don't have an option to say no. <laughs> Donnerkind88 asks, In 1914, how does a Tegethoff-class battleship compare against the best battleships of other great power navies, US, UK, France, Germany, Japan? Uh, what are the main strengths and weaknesses of a Tegethoff, and roughly how would a 1v1 go between those various nations' best battleships? Assuming uh, crews rested, high morale, well commanded, both ships are at maximum seaworthiness. Well, <laughs> A lot of this is, again, going to depend on what type of Tegat Hof glass we're going to take. Basically, we have three options. We can take the Tegat Hof glass on paper. We can take the best Tegat Hof as built, or we can be really nitpicky and take um, the worst examples of it. Because, for example, uh, much as I am in many ways obligated to like the uh, SMS Svent Istvan, it really was not very well built at all, um, so, uh, even, even for a Tegethoff. Um, and again, there's the case of the Tegethoffs on paper are pretty capable ships. As built, I mean, that they're, they're, they're not, for the time of construction, they're not absolute top-of-the-line ships in the first place. 
albeit they're probably on paper some of the best 12 inch gun dreadnoughts designed but in practice there is a huge gulf of difference um, in practice there are a number of small design changes substitutions um, and design basic design errors in the fine detail that severely compromise them uh, as i've said before in other questions related to this particular class if you gave the basic or even the sort of last but one design plan of the Tegethoffs to something like Germany, Britain or America and said build this, the end result would come out a lot better and a lot higher performance than the Tegethoffs themselves actually did. But that's kind of what happens when you have a PAL that's mostly land-based with a relatively minimal naval building experience trying to turn out a rather groundbreaking style of dreadnought. But nevertheless, the choice of latest and best battleship in commission in 1914 exactly does actually throw up a number of interesting possibilities. Now, let's get the elephant in the room out of the way. Technically speaking, HMS Queen Elizabeth is in commission in December 1914. And yeah, there's not really much way of a Tegethoff taking on a Queen Elizabeth. The Queen Elizabeth is more heavily armed, more heavily armoured. Uh, faster, bigger, etc, etc. Let's just, let's just get rid of that one fairly quickly. Uh, another one that we can discount pretty sharpish is the New York class, also coming into commission around this time for the US Navy. Again, much larger, fractionally faster, uh, 21 knots versus 20. Um, belt armor and other armor protection is a bit, little bit, not massively, but still a bit thicker and it has a main armament of 14 inch guns so yeah uss texas that's probably going to deal with a ticket off fairly handily now going to the other end of the spectrum in terms of ships the ticket off almost certainly could deal with um, we have the corbet class because the britannias the uh, second french dreadnoughts not actually in service in 1914 um, only the corbets are and when you compare the Corbets, yeah, they're, they're a bit bigger than the Tegethoffs, but not by anywhere near as much as Texas, New York, and Queen Elizabeth are. Speed-wise, well, 21 knots, yeah, they're slightly faster, but not enough to make much of a difference. Armament-wise, Tegethoff has a heavier broadside, and they are both using 12-inch guns. And the Corbets have appalling range on those 12-inch guns, and also not a particular particularly impressive belt a belt that's only just a little bit thicker than is present on the british battle cruisers at the time the the lion and its derivatives so yeah put put a single corbet up against a single tegethoff well the, the sort of take the best tegethoff and put it up against uh, a corbet class and actually I'd, I'd i'd be sliding a few fennigs in the direction of uh the tegethoffs in that particular case the Japanese also have a similar situation in that their only dreadnought class in operation at that point is the Kawachis. The Fuso's not yet in service, and it reads pretty much similar. In fact, their broadside is even less. The Tegethoff's broadside, of course, being 12, 12 inch guns, Corbe's being 10, and the Kawachis being 8. So the Kawachis have an even smaller batter, uh, broadside of 8 inch guns. Their belt armor is, is actually slightly better than the Tegethoffs. Their speed is that 21 knots, but the size-wise, they're about the same size. So you're effectively giving the Tegethoffs half, again, as many more guns. 11-inch armor, 12-inch belt armor. Eh. Um, I mean, that's what happens when you put a sort of a second-generation Dreadnought up against an early first-gen. Um, so yes, the, the Tegethoff could probably take a Kawachi as well. Um, so the French and the uh, Japanese are out. The interesting thing is obviously then when the Fusos come in, that completely flips that equation around on its head. Whereas when the Britannias come in, eh, I'd have to look at that in a lot more detail. Then in the almost exact middle of the pack, you have the Germans. And the Germans at this point in 1914 are bringing the Koenig class into service, their last 12-inch gunned. Dreadnoughts. Now these are larger again than the Tegethoffs, not quite as large 
uh, and overmatching as Texas, New York, and Queen Elizabeth, but still significantly. Um, propulsion, once again, 20 versus 21 knots. Well, it's a bit of a wash. Armor-wise, however, they are significantly better armored than the Tegethoffs. Um, and their main battery, although it's numerically smaller with 10 guns versus 12, they are still 12-inch guns. So this one's a bit of an interesting one because firepower-wise, technically on paper, the Tegethoffs have an advantage. However, that significantly greater armor on the Koenigs, I think, is going to definitely turn the battle in favor of Koenig or Kronfrinz Wilhelm or whichever particular Koenig you want to send after them um, because it does afford the, the German ships a certain amount of immunity at useful battle ranges that the Tegethoffs do not have. And bear in mind, I'm saying we're, we're looking at the, the optimal Tegethoff in this particular case. So... Yeah, of the five, two are definite curb stomps in favour of the other power ships, that being the Texas, the Texas Dash, New York class, and Queen Elizabeth. Two of them, I'd say the Tegat Office actually have a, a re, pretty decent advantage, that being the Koachi and Corbe. And then you've got the Koenig sitting there in the middle, um, where the Tegat Hoffs have theoretically slightly greater firepower, but the better protection and greater damage absorption capabilities of the larger Koenigs will give the Koenigs an advantage there. Commander Unnamed asked, USS Hornet at Santa Cruz, how could she have been saved prior to or after the attack that crippled her? So it depends exactly what you define as the attack that crippled her. Hornet at Santa Cruz, effectively you can group the attacks on her into two major blocks before the first one she's fine but it's really that first cluster that actually cripples her because she takes a couple of torpedo hits plus a couple of what I call not unintentional but incidental kamikazes i.e aircraft that deliberately crashed themselves into the ship but didn't go out there with the intention of doing so in the first place and this is something that's actually seen not on a very wide scale, but infrequently throughout the early part of the Pacific campaign, certainly, and very occasionally in other theatres, whereby an aircraft that is badly damaged might choose to crash into its target just in an effort to do that last bit of extra damage to the opponent. And that was seen, to, as I said, to a small degree on all sides prior to the deployment of the formal kamikaze missions later in the war. So after effectively four hits, two, let's say two of these incidental kamikazes and a couple of torpedoes, she was crippled. She needed to be towed. So what could have been unsaver before that attack? Well, don't get hit. Um, I mean, that's a bit, I know it sounds a bit trite, but there wasn't really a, anything to do until those those hits occurred. Now, the second attack was just a single hit to the starboard side, that's generally seen as the fatal blow because, well, A, it's more flooding, more holes in the side, and B, the although the Hornet had lost power, the damage control parties on board had managed to restore some power, and then this torpedo hit wiped out pretty much everything they'd been trying to do, so they were now back at square one, except now, so even with more flooding and an even nastier list. It was that that prompted the call to abandon ship, combined with the fact that Japanese surface ships were on their way, or reported to be on their way, and indeed they did eventually show up. So if you're looking at that hit, well, they were doing everything they could to save the Hornet before that. Uh, but unfortunately, it was under tow at very low speed, there's precious little they could have done to avoid that that next hit by um, by the torpedo from the torpedo bombers, with the small possible exception of basically scrambling every fighter that that, that was available in the battle area to form a low level cap, but that would compromise the cap for Enterprise, which would not be a good thing. Um, it would also mean that if dive bombers showed up they'd be stuffed 
Um, and would also mean, obviously, with lots of friendly aircraft operating at low altitude, then the anti-aircraft batteries of, well, Hornet, Northampton, and anyone else in the vicinity also would not really be able to engage all that well without the risk of hitting friendly. So, yeah, in terms of preventing that hit, yeah, there's there's not a tremendous amount, I think, that could be done at that point. In terms of saving the ship afterwards, well, the interesting thing is that after the decision was made to abandon the Hornet, it took a heck of a lot of punishment before it finally went down. Um, initially, the US Navy tried to scuttle it with torpedoes and 5-inch rounds. The 5-inch rounds worked perfectly well, but it stayed afloat. They fired a ton of torpedoes into it, but of course this is early war US Navy, so the majority of them just went bonk, um, which didn't really help matters all that much. Um, but even much later on, once the Japanese uh, destroyers did find the ship, it was still afloat, and they ended up putting a bunch of long lances into it, and that finally sent the Hornet to the bottom. So... That would imply that, much like the uh, Yorktown, Hornet had an awful lot of durability and uh, buoyancy left in her at the point where the damage control efforts looked to be pretty much beyond hope. Now, I think, given the scenario, if we're talking about absolute maximum thing that could be done to save her, I think, theoretically... Given that she stayed afloat for so long, and given that she took so much additional firepower to finally put under, there's probably a reasonable chance that a full-on damage control effort might have been able to patch up the patch-ups, get some power back, and get the ship upright again, or slightly more upright and able to be taken away. On the other hand, she did have plenty of holes in the bottom, so it may have just been prolonging the inevitable. But I think the the sort of the deciding factor there was the fact that the Japanese surface forces were coming in, and the one place you do not want to be is on a ship towing a dead carrier, effectively at five six knots, because that's just basically setting yourself up as a free kill. So, yeah, if. Yeah, I'd say in, in theory, in a purely practical sense of could the ship itself have been salvaged at that point in a sterile environment? Yes, probably. But I wouldn't well I wouldn't say hundred percent because as I say I don't I don't know the exact details of exactly how much damage exactly which bulkheads were breached, etc. etc. However, in the practical sense of the scenario that she was in Probably there wasn't much that could be done. The The only thing that realistically could have allowed the damage control parties to be left aboard by any kind of responsible commander would have been to send out a surface force capable of dealing with the incoming Japanese surface forces, which they clearly felt they couldn't do. And let's face it, at the end of the day, at the Battle of Santa Cruz, you've just lost one of your carriers. Enterprise has taken heavy damage, and although the Japanese have suffered damage to two of their four carriers, they still have two other carriers operational, and the first two aren't sunk. Granted, their aircraft have taken some losses, but realistically, if you have minimal to no air cover and one, as a heavily damaged carrier, and your enemy has two possibly more operational flight decks... Is it really responsible to put more lives on the line trying to salvage the one that you already think is probably going to sink anyway? No, not really. So, yeah, this this is one of the things if in t it, when you're talking about these kind of could X ship have been saved, it's not just would it be physically possible in an ideal environment, it's also what was the actual operational environment at the time. I mean, it's much like, say, with the Bismarck. Could Bismarck have been saved from uh, King George V and Rodney? Yes, if it happened to be 200 miles further east, but it wasn't, and so the Luftwaffe couldn't come out to help. Brett Hecker asks, What were some of the issues with converting a merchant ship to an aircraft carrier, like Shinyo, or the Merchant Aircraft Carrier Program? Were there any handling characteristics or storage issues unique to a conversion that couldn't be rectified? So, yes, there were a number of issues, but it 
varies quite considerably depending on what program you're looking at. So, because if you're looking at something like, say, Shinyo, the issues are, there are some in common, but a lot very different from something like the Merchant Aircraft Carrier Program. So I'll try to explain uh, briefly. When you're looking at something like Shinyo or some of the German plans, not the Graf Zeppelin, but some of the other German plans for converting aircraft carriers from civilian ships and uh, the Italians as well uh, were trying to do uh, similar. The biggest problems you run into when you're trying to do a full-on effectively light fleet carrier or heavy, I guess you could maybe call it heavy escort carrier, is that most civilian ships are designed purely for economy. Even the liners outside of a few very large ones that were designed for high-speed runs to get the blue ribboned or similar are not going to be able to match the kind of speed you need from your more mainline carriers or 30 knots plus. So at upgrading their power plants is just out of the question. You could in theory maybe do it. Um, there might be the space because there's cargo um, areas etc. But that would re involve stripping out and replacing the entire power plant, drive system, etc., etc. At which point the cost would be so ridiculous, you might as well just build a new carrier from scratch. And so the speed is going to be limited. That in turn limits the kind of aircraft you can operate and also the operational environment because you've got all sorts. I mean, naval fighters and uh, strike aircraft are obviously designed to be able to take off from a shorter runway as possible, given that ships do not have unlimited length, but there are degrees to that. So a high-performance fighter will need a longer distance generally to take off. So that, that's, for example, why uh, later in the war you see wildcats operating off of smaller carriers in the US Navy, because they can operate off of those flight decks, whereas some of the other fighters, um, like the Hellcat, prefer to be on fleet carrier flight decks. So you've immediately got a problem of low vessel speed, means that if you want to operate anything, it's going to have to be one of your shorter takeoff um, aircraft. Something, well, in, if you're a British ship, then something like a swordfish, for example. And you're probably also going to need to turn into the wind. Um, which, again, is an ideal scenario for any carrier, but if you've got something like, say, an Essex, and you're operating something that's got a pretty good um, takeoff run in terms of being a carrier aircraft, you can sometimes operate, well, you don't want to operate crosswind particularly, but you can operate in low wind conditions, whereas if you've got a ship that's doing 20, 22 knots, you're almost certainly going to have to head into the wind, um, even with something that's relatively... Uh, good for takeoff. Now, that's one problem. Another problem is merchant ships are not, unsurprisingly, built with massive anti-torpedo defences or armour, which makes them incredibly vulnerable to damage compared to most military ships. So if you look at something like, say, the Independence class converted off of Cleveland hulls, well, they're converted from light cruiser hulls, therefore the placement of their magazines, the um, strength of the the hull, and the anti-torpedo defences are all to military standards. If you're converting a cruise liner, or a liner in general, they generally are not known for having massive anti-torpedo bulkheads and such like, which means that if your ship does take a torpedo, that's going to be a much bigger problem than it would be for a military converted ship. And that's not just in terms of flooding, that's also in terms of magazines, because torpedo defences, even if you get flooding, they still absorb a fair bit of the explosive power of a torpedo, or indeed things like thin belt armour, splinter belts, etc., will absorb um, splinters from shells, whereas a civilian ship is going to be very, very vulnerable to all that kind of thing. Uh, and some things like the escort carriers as well, the sort of production-built escort carriers had similar problems just because of their size. Now, on top of that, you've also got to consider the overall strength of the hull, not just its ability to resist damage, but, but also these ships are never designed to be carriers, and they're never designed to carry heavy loads 
high up now when you're talking about something like, say, Eagle or Karga or Lexington or Amagi or Saratoga or even Courageous and Glorious, etc. Whilst those ships are conversions and they were never designed to have flight decks, they were designed to carry heavy gun turrets and guns that combined had weights of several thousand tons above the main deck of the ship. So adding a massive but relatively speaking less dense flight deck structure is not as much of a imposition on the ship's overall structural integrity as it would be for a civilian ship that, as I said, the, the heaviest thing it's supposed to carry above the main deck is just generic superstructure, no armor, nothing. So you're going to have limits there as well. So yeah, th there's quite a few problems, and those kind of carry across the board. However, with the Merchant Aircraft Carrier Program, it is somewhat less of a concern, mainly because... With something like the Shinyo, you're actually trying to use it for some form of combat operation. Maybe not front-line combat operation, but certainly escort, land strike, anti-submarine warfare. Um, although that's a bit questionable. Um, and eventually you might end up pr having to get pressed into front-line service, a bit like the escort carriers of Taffy 3. But with a merchant aircraft carrier program, they were just purely designed to sit in the convoys. And, yeah, okay, fair enough. If they got torpedoed, then see the previous parts of the response for all the problems that could cause. But their conversions were a lot less sophisticated. With something like Shinyo, you're talking about raising superstructures, delving deep into the ship, scooping out large portions of it, um, etc., to, to fit magazines and hangars and all this. With the merchant aircraft carriers, some of them are quite literally a case of here is merchant ship. Take off a few extraneous railings and things because the superstructure is already at the back or wherever. You might take the superstructure off in some cases and literally just put a deck on top of it. Put planes on the deck. Congratulations, you now have a merchant aircraft carrier. Um, some of the cargo holes could be repurposed as magazines, spare parts, etc. But on a lot of the merchant aircraft carriers, they didn't even have hangars. Or lifts. It was just, no, we, we would just put the planes on the deck and there's a few of them and we hope everything works out. And that's about that. Some of the more sophisticated versions could actually store aircraft in hangars and such like. But again, it's still a case of, well, we're just using some big existing void spaces. And a lot of merchant aircraft carriers could still, at least in theory, carry cargo, which is why, amongst other reasons, things like grain carriers and oil tankers were preferred for this kind of conversion. Although the oil tankers... They tried to avoid it where possible because the transport of fuel was very important, but the main thing was that once you've stuck a massive great hangar deck over the top, transporting things like tanks is somewhat difficult because it's very difficult to wedge one of those under the flight deck, or and they don't have phase technology so they can't go through the flight deck, uh, but something that is granular or liquid can just be pumped in through the side, through the gaps, which is a lot easier. So, yeah, with the merchant aircraft carriers, there's a lot fewer problems, and to say they're acknowledged as purely convoy defensive um, units, so you can, if, if they take a hit, they take a hit, so be it. it. It didn't cost you too much to convert, whereas something like Shinyo, that's carrying considerably more aircraft, considerably more munitions, and has cost considerably more, is unfortunately about just as vulnerable, in fact more vulnerable, because it's carrying more explosives, which is actually what happened to it when it got hit. It just went, well, mixture of fuel and explosive just went boom not pleasant but quick Vinve asks a rather topical question during the ages of sail and steam how did navies react when an outbreak of a contagious disease took place aboard a warship now obviously practices across that kind of time period we're talking hundreds if not thousands of years varied quite considerably um, both in time and from nation to nation and as you reach the end of that period, obviously techniques and treatment change quite significantly as medical systems are sure become quite readily available. However, prior to that kind of period, it was not a pleasant thing to be on a warship when an outbreak of disease took place, precisely because of that lack of widespread medical treatment facilities. 
ultimately you kind of had a few branching options what it was effectively was the disease treatable or not in any kind of effective sense secondly where were you and thirdly how big was the ship now the general practice if you had a ship that had an outbreak of contagion on board um that was anywhere near a population center let's say it's its home port or whatever would be harsh as it sounds stay the heck away and that would sometimes have to be enforced by gunfire it, because if you didn't have an effective way of treating the pandemic the last thing you wanted to do was to bring it ashore so ships would just be told to anchor offshore a way away and what basically wait it out and then once either everybody was dead or at least the the sort of the pandemic had passed through the ship then they could come ashore and there there, there were certain supplies uh, sort of provided for that so one one system that was relatively common in this kind of scenario would be that the ship could send a boat and the boat would communicate by shouting or usually through a, a basic loud hailer or something like that what they needed and how they were going to pay for it and then if the locals were feeling cooperative they would load up uh, their own boat with the supplies and then the the um quarantine ship in question would load up a uh, couple of they'd have a couple of boats they'd have one boat of theirs that was loaded one boat that was empty they'd anchor their boat their empty boat um sort of halfway between the locals would bring the supplies out they'd put them in the empty boat they'd collect the payment which would also have been placed in the empty boat and this is obviously all in theory assuming that everything works per perfectly um and then the manned boat from the ship would come and take the unmanned boat into tow take it back to the ship and they had supplies so actually a relatively relatively sensible and effective air air gap to stop the spread of the contagion now if it was treatable then it was slightly different because it depended on what kind of what kind of way was it treatable was it treatable by something you had to find and gather i did people go oh, we have this disease we know that x thing will cure it now although it's not technically contagious scurvy is a good example once they figured out that tropical fruit was uh, a way to cure scurvy i sit stuff with uh, citrus in it then you would go okay well we have this outbreak we need to find somewhere that either can supply or has naturally growing this kind of fruit and then we can land and we can treat ourselves the kind of onboard treatment and of course if uh if the onboard ship's doctor if they had one knew how to treat the disease in question with the supplies he had then he would obviously try and do that as well now if it was something that maybe the ship's doctor couldn't treat or could treat but couldn't treat that many patients then that was another matter again this kind of depended on the level of um medical care that was available if it was a case of yeah we know how to treat this we have some kind of medical facility even an impromptu one available on shore then there might be some certain limited access to the shore to allow the the sick to disembark they weren't completely heartless but they were relatively pragmatic about the fact that for the majority of this period a pandemic was a pandemic and harsher than it might sound you just don't want that on shore because there's a lot more people who'll die on shore than there are who'll die on a single ship and it must be said before anyone points out that yes there were governmental authorities and such like who hid behind those kind of concerns to deal with problems shall we say one of the uh one of the less pleasant chapters of the whole armada episode was the fact that disease did actually break out in the english fleet whilst they were pursuing the spanish armada up through the north sea and whilst the spanish had disappeared around the coast of scotland which of course at the time was a completely separate country and the commanders were begging to allow their men to come on shore to recover and get treatment the government of the time obviously elizabeth the first's government decided that officially they needed to remain at sea to guard against a possible return by the armada despite the fact that 
the people on the scene were going uh, that the wind is entirely the wrong direction for sail powered ships to come back in any way shape or form um unofficially the governmental officials had basically decided that well if a bunch of them happen to die while they're out at sea then when the ships come back they'll have much fewer crews which means we have to pay a lot fewer people ah don't you love bureaucracy and finally, our lockdown special question, i.e. the question that extends the dry dock just a little bit so that everyone out there has a little bit more to listen to during this period, is uh, from someone whose name I have managed to completely lose. So apologies for that, but I did promise you it would be in dry dock episode 90, so here it is. Question is, during the World War One, World War Two era, was the ammunition capacity in ships of much consideration, or could captains generally fire at will on anything within range without worrying too much about needing to close distance to conserve ammunition? So, yeah, ammunition capacity was a pretty major concern in almost all all warships in both eras, especially in World War II when you had considerably more different types of ammunition to take into account because, let's say on a, a battleship in World War I, you would have to worry about your main gun ammunition, your secondary battery ammunition, and maybe some kind of small caliber anti-torpedo boat ammunition, but probably that wasn't a massive deal because, well, that's mainly what your secondary batteries were for. Flip forward to the Second World War, and if you are doing mixed battery like the Germans, say on Bismarck, you've got your main battery ammunition, you've got your uh, secondary anti-surface battery ammunition, you've got your primary anti-aircraft battery ammunition, and then you have at least one, possibly two or three calibers of light to medium anti-aircraft ammunition. If you're using dual purpose guns, that reduces things slightly because you will just have a secondary battery, but then you've got to worry about, well, we've got a limited amount of magazine capacity per gun. Some of that's going to have to be star shell. Some of that's going to have to be anti-aircraft ammunition. Some of that's going to have to be high explosive. Some of that might have to be semi-armor piercing or armor piercing if we've got some of the larger guns, um, like five or six inch or something like that. So we've got all of this to worry about, and obviously that means your individual stockpiles for any given type are going to be less, which was one of the few drawbacks of dual-purpose guns. And you still have all your light and medium anti-aircraft weaponry to worry about as well. So yeah, there's a, there's a lot of ammunition, and of course if you're the Japanese you also have to worry about the uh, your Type 3 stocks eating into your AP and HE sh <laughs> stocks as well, which probably doesn't help matters all that much. And... Worrying about ammo capacity was was not just a, a theoretical exercise. It genuinely actually affected a number of ships. For example, in its various exploits chasing Italian destroyers and light cruisers all over the Mediterranean, HMAS Sydney ran out of six-inch ammunition, which was a bit awkward. But fortunately, the Italians, the lost Italians they'd been chasing, had kind of run off by the time that happened, so no one quite noticed. Uh, we've covered in more sort of more well not necessarily relaxed but slightly less dangerous conditions the various battleships bombarding uh, at d-day would often run through their stocks war spy in texas for example notorious for both running out of main gun ammo and having to pop back for new ammo and eventually new guns um and in slightly more dangerous concerns popping back to the mediterranean again you have a number of Royal Navy ships sunk during the evacuation of Crete, in large part because they've expended literally every single anti-aircraft round on the ship. And this is why at the beginning of the Second World War, quite a number of ships, especially um, a lot of on paper treaty compliant ships, such as the county class, town class, etc. in the Royal Navy and a few others in other navies, magically start to appear with considerably more shells on board than their sort of uh, their their ship's cover or legend says that they should be capable of carrying because people are capable of thinking ahead for these kind of situations so yeah um and as i say that it's if a, if a ship is runs out of anti-aircraft ammunition like they did off of crete yeah that that's when you get sunk because it's a lot easier for someone to come after you when you can't fire back. 
you've then got other scenarios such as at the Battle of Surigao Strait, the Seventh Fleet, the old battleships, fired off considerable amounts of their armor-piercing ammunition. Now, fair enough, they were there mainly for shore bombardment, so they were stocking up slightly more on the high explosive than would otherwise be the case. But still, it's one of the one of the sort of small lesser factors to consider when, if you were going to say, well, what would happen if Seventh Fleet somehow got word that the center force was coming through and skedaddled on northwards straight after putting down Fuso and Yamashiro to try and assist Taffy 3. And one of those concerns is if it's after that Battle of Surigao Strait, they don't actually have that much armor-piercing ammo left. So that could have been a concern. So yeah, ammunition capacity is definitely a worry. In a given single engagement probably not something you need to worry about too much unless you're something like maybe Salt Lake City trying to fight off two or three times as many ships as as it has um but a lot of World War II engagements either stretch on very for a considerable period of time or there are multiple engagements during a single voyage and that can tax your ammunition limits quite significantly now of course the flip side of that is survival it's like well if you <laughs> there's no point sinking with ammunition on board when you could have used that ammunition to help you survive um you know the the old classic uh gamer trope of yes i have 16 restores 14 health potions 17 mana potions and such i'm dying but i might need them later that's not how <laughs> that's not how it works when you're at sea um Hence why you get situations like at Crete where they fired off all their anti-aircraft ammunition after a couple of days. So, yeah, there weren't specific restrictions um, on ships saying, well, you can only fire X amount of ammunition in any given engagement, because it was generally understood that, well, one, that was a stupid rule, and two, even if you tried to implement it, virtually no one's actually going to follow it. Um, the, the one aspect of closing distance to conserve ammunition comes about is when you are doing a, a long-range engagement accuracy is just going to be automatically lower so you can either expend vast amounts of ammunition and achieve not a lot or you can close the range and probably achieve something considerably better by blasting away with considerably better accuracy so yes there were guidelines around closing uh, the distance during an engagement where possible to try and ensure the optimal use of ammunition but that was not so much about preserving your ammunition stocks as it was about getting as many hits i.e making most efficient use of the ammunition because the other thing you've got to bear in mind is that when you're engaging at extreme long range whether or not you get a hit is broadly speaking much more down to luck than judgment which for any kind of navy that prides itself as professional and was probably going to be thinking of itself as superior to the other side putting who gets hit first and thus who, who likely loses the engagement down to luck is downgrading your chances whereas the closer you push in generally speaking the more and more skill comes into play and therefore the better ship should win and of course as i say with most navies and most captains you are of course the better ship therefore of course you want to close in um unless of course you're horribly outmatched although that might not d deter you in some cases captain v and looking at you um but yes there you go and that brings us to the end of this week's dry dock thank you very much for listening and i hope to see you again soon in another video